Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandian. You know, the one of the greatest ways to defeat your enemy is not to become your enemy. David told us in the Word of God, don't be envious of the workers of iniquity. So stop being jealous of them. And think about this. God has a plan for your life with the success attached to it without any sin in it at all. Let's go to the Word of God together. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. It's great to have you today. If you want to find Psalm 37 verses 1 and 2, we'll be going there in just a moment. But today I just simply wanted to get a Word of God to you and talk to you about the importance of resting in God, learning to be patient for the things that God wants you to have. You know, there was a number of years ago, we had a, a, a group of young men run for a Congress and Senate in Washington. They called it, a, you know, a, a contract with America. And what they were gonna do, they had a contract laid out with, you know, a number of points they were going, they promised to keep those points. And so we voted on them. We did, They got swept into office. And then we asked later, about seven, eight months later, whatever happened to the points they were gonna keep? And, oh, we're coming, we're coming, we're still working on it never did come to pass. I mean, a few of them did, but not. The problem was those young, naive young men went up there thinking they're going to carry their morals and all that things in there, but never knew the pressure they're going to be un under and ended up becoming their enemy. That was so sad that many of them, you wonder whatever happened to them, they got kind of sucked into the system. They saw all the things around them. They found out that quick riches can be gained uh, while being in Washington, even though you don't have much of a salary, yet there's people out there willing to pay you to do what they want you to do. And just that pressure that he lived under continually. And it shows you that character has to be more than just surface deep. It has to be something on the inside of you, the integrity in your heart. You need to be able to walk in it under the greatest of pressure. You say, well, is there any examples of that? Well, David was one of them. David was a man that even though he started out young and naive, as he grew up, he maintained that integrity. And at times he let it slip. At times he failed. At times he yielded to the pressures of those things around him for quick riches or just for quick notoriety or just for something quick that he wanted. And so I'm just simply calling this today, don't become your enemy. You know, one of the greatest ways to defeat your enemy is not to become your enemy. Don't take on their attitudes. And sometimes when we see people that we consider, it's not just the person that's our enemy. It's it's basically what they believe to what they stand for. And that makes, you know, we understand we don't want to be that way. So we make those type of vows where we stand there and we, you know, we take our fist and curl it up and stomp on our Bible and promise we won't do things like that. But after living around it for so long, it simply comes back to it that patience needs to be something that we walk in because the Bible says that quick riches take wings. In fact, that's true also with power popularity, that things that come quick are gone so quick. Think how many uh, rock singers were out, you know, just a number of years ago, they're not even heard much of today. Oh, we now hear their songs on the oldie stations, but you know, they're really not that old, but they're, they're maybe their, you know, songs lasted two or three albums and they were just kind of disappeared. And while they were there and under that notoriety, they spent money like crazy, bought cars, homes, things like that, and found out later on, you know, it doesn't last. And we try to tell them it doesn't last, but they don't believe it. They somehow think they are unique. And so again, to find somebody that's got a brain in their head uh, in the world is difficult, but you know, finding a Christian that will walk in integrity and maintain that integrity is also hard to find. So we're gonna use David as an example today. I think about when David was first discovered, you know, uh, Samuel the prophet came because God told him to go to the house of Jesse and he would find the next king there. So Jesse paraded his six sons out in front of them, or seven sons, and, and left David out in the field taking care of the sheep because why? Daddy wasn't too proud of him. Man, his other sons were going to college. They were in the military. You know, they had uh, were headed for great rank in the military, and then the father was just so proud of them. But David was out there keeping the sheep, so he didn't bring David in. And it's interesting to see that uh, what God wanted was what David had, and that was integrity. He learned more taking care of the sheep than he did in a college a university or else even going to the military himself. He was just out there and all he had was basically the word of God, a bunch of sheep. And uh, you know, those sheep themselves, you know, they don't take much, you know, uh, they need you for a while, then they want you just to leave them alone. They need you to take care of them, to feed them, to protect them. But after that, when things are calm, they just want to be out there eating grass, you know? And so that's what David was used to. And so the first thing that David ran into with his father was his father would overlook him. Uh, since he was out there in the field and, and, you know, they didn't think much about a shepherd, the father just left him there. And so whenever the prophet came by and all the six sons were put out in front of him, you know, starting with Eliab, the oldest, and on down, 
down, you know, one after another. He stood there and looked at them and God would go, no, he's not the one. No, he's not the one. After six of them, I mean, he, he looked at, at uh, you know, Jesse and said, do you have any more? And he goes, yeah, we got one more, but, but he keeps the sheep. I mean, just the, the way he said it, he keeps the sheep. So, you know, it's almost like, well, you know, I'll go get him. But you know what? Even finding out he's a shepherd, he probably smells like the sheep, looks like the sheep. He probably has, you know, um, you know, fur on him and, and dirt and stuff like that and, a few, and pieces of straw here and there. And that's what he does all day long. That's just what he's out there doing. So in other words, what kind of preparation is keeping the sheep? Well, I think about throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, it was Moses that tended sheep for 40 years until he learned to subdue himself. And then he went back to uh, deliver Israel from Egypt. And so he had to do that before he could go back there. In other words, God had to sweat Moses out of Moses and make him a nobody to where God could finally make him a somebody. He started out as a somebody thinking himself as great and God had to get all of that out of him and bring him to the point where after 40 years, he said, I can't even speak now. And God said, good, that's what I've been looking for. Your brother can go speak for yourself, he says, or you know, you can come to yourself and that's what happened. You know, that Aaron spoke for him for a little bit, but finally Moses pushed him out of the way and started speaking for himself. So David ran into this thing about my father's just overlooking me. So whenever he was brought in, of course, I'm sure the son saw me, oh my gosh, here he is. You know, he had to bring that smell into the house, had to bring that look into the house, you're dragging hay with you and all the different stuff. And when he got into the house, the first thing the Lord told uh, the prophet was, Samuel, this, this one's the one. And so he became the one. I'm sure the first thing that David in his naivety must have thought was why does my father overlook me? I mean, he couldn't see what his father saw. He didn't look with the eyes that his father saw, and he couldn't understand why his father played favorites. And really, his father shouldn't have, but the father simply looked at all the natural things we look at, education, what position he has, where he's going to school, what kind of job he has. Look, he's in the military. All these things that would, are good for kingly material, especially when the prophet comes in looking for the next king. Next of all, once David went down to slay Goliath, his, he met his brothers down there and his brothers were angry with him. Well, what, what, how did you leave those few paltry sheep back there? Now he's probably wondering, my father overlooks me. Now my brothers are angry. Why are they angry with me? David was so naive, he couldn't see it. And with that naivety, there was a simplicity about David that attracted people, but always, again, those that had power hated him because those with power usually did it by pulling the right strings, doing the right things. And much like those ones I talked about that went off to Congress and sin and then just kind of disappeared. And after a while, you don't hear about them anymore. They got caught up in the traps of trying to be their enemy and or act like their enemy. Or after a while, with all the pressure, you finally just give up and think, why should I keep on doing it? Look at these guys. These guys are doing things wrong and look how much money they have, position they have, power they have. And so they just yield to it. And what I'm calling this today again is don't become your enemy. Then next of all, once he came into the position and the women and the and, and the nation loved him. They even made hit songs about him when he went to battle and came back that Saul has slain his thousands and David has slain his tens of thousands. And all of a sudden, King Saul became jealous of him. And David, again, in his naivety, couldn't see it. He just, uh, he was sitting there and suddenly Saul would throw a spear at him and David would just you know move off the side. The spear would probably stick in the wall and David would go, huh, maybe he's not having such a good day. He couldn't see it. Saul began to hate the one that at first he loved and he found out he couldn't use him. He couldn't use him to gain notoriety for himself. Everything that David did drew attention to himself. And David now was more popular than him, killing more people than him. And he began to look more like king material than Saul did. So Saul was jealous of him. And so probably David thought, first of all, why does my father overlook me? Why are my brothers angry with me? Why is King Saul treating me this way? Next of all, when he became the king, his sons tried to overthrow him, two of them. And probably David at that time thought, why are they trying to overthrow me? One of them, Absalom, that tried to overthrow him, David ran, just simply got on his horse, went by himself, took one guy with him, but went off to, and just simply got before God saying, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? I mean, God must have laughed at him and said, David, you've never lost that naivety. That is good for you. It's good to look at yourself and see yourself as a nobody that God made a somebody out of. David never lost that. That simplicity that we as ministers of the gospel, that we as Christians need to maintain and quit trying to imitate the world because we desire their riches, we desire their power, we desire their wealth, we desire their popularity. So David thought, why is my son trying to overthrow me? And next of all, then he found out, he actually reported, why does my closest friend raise his heel against me? 
And so David was wondering about this. In fact, he became a type of what happened with Jesus in the New Testament. And here we have David saying, why did my closest friend raise his heel up against me? And so next of all, the question he asked quite often throughout the Psalms is this, why do the heathen prosper? Why do the wicked prosper? Why does prosperity for a righteous man take so long? And God kept answering that question, but at the very end of David's life, he became again one of the wealthiest men in the world. He was only eclipsed by his son, Solomon. So you can fret over your enemies so much for prospering that eventually you give up and even take on their ways. That's what I was talking about with the young men that went to Washington. And we find it throughout the Old Testament, oftentimes when a person became uh, in the place where God wanted them to be, that they began to be overwhelmed by the wealth of the wicked, the power of the wicked, and, and they went after them. Samson was one of those. I'm sure by now that you found Psalm 37, and we're going to take a look at verses one and two. And again, you can fret over your enemies so much for prospering that eventually you just give up and you take on their ways. Psalm 37, one and two says this, don't fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they will soon be cut down like the grass. What God is saying is don't look at the momentary victories they're having, the momentary prosperities, the momentary happiness, and the momentary, the power they have, for soon they're going to be cut down like grass. Well, the the first place where they're, where they're cut down like grass is usually when they're overtaken militarily, or beyond that is when they die. But there's going to come a time too at the great white throne judgment when all unbelievers will be cast in the lake of fire. And we're going to find out that's when they're eventually not only going to be cut down like grass, but to be burned like grass that has been cut down. We ask this question so much. In fact, there's Christian books being written today. And here's what so often they try to answer because it's the common question that Christians ask. Why do bad things happen to good people? And they, you know, we, I'm now born again, but you know what? I have problems in life. And why do I have problems in life? And I look around me and it seem like the, the unrighteous have enough money to, to, to have a good time and seem like they're always having a good time. Why do bad things happen to good people? David didn't ask that question. What bothered him throughout the Psalms was why do good things happen to bad people? Why do the wicked Prosper, he doesn't understand that he was so saturated with the word of God. This is the way prosperity comes. This is the way power comes. This is the way in life that promotion comes. And he looked at it from God's viewpoint and he kept wondering, the things I'm trying for, I haven't got there yet, but the wicked have already got there. How can they do that? And David had to work hard at not being naive about people. You can come to a point where you say, I've done everything right and got nowhere, so why fight it? And there was a couple of times that David did that. And in your own life, don't reach that point where you look at the wicked for so long, you finally say, why fight it? Why don't I just go ahead and do it? You know, low paid policemen, and most all policemen are underpaid, face this when arresting criminals. Often, eventually, they begin to steal money themselves. They find ways to get it, and they simply say, why should these wicked people have it? I need to have some it for myself. And the way they go to get the money is they become Become wicked themselves. So it would be just as easy for David to personally take revenge at times he did, but then there's times he got over it. We're going to talk about that when we come back from the break. So you'll find out how you can have a series on what I'm teaching right now. Even though we know that all storms of life are only temporary, they sometimes seem like they are about to engulf us, sink us, and take us under. At this moment, the wind and waves may be raging, heaving, and crashing all around you, but there is a refuge and rest in the Lord. But even if you are in the center of a storm, far from all other help, you can cast all your cares on the Lord and enter into God's supernatural rest, right there in the very middle of that storm. Join Pastor Bob Yandian as he explains what you must know and believe in order to sail through all the storms of life completely at peace and totally burden-free. To order Resting Through the Storms of Life, go to bobyandian.com. Join Pastor Bob Yandian as he explores the scriptures and explains how David responded to jealousy, betrayal, defeat, praise, fear, victory, and repentance. Available on CDs, MP3 downloads, or a flash drive, these 32 messages represent a masterful and inspiring character study of the life and person of David. To order The Life of David, go to bobbyandian.com. 
Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. There were times in David's life where it was so easy for David to personally take revenge, and there's a few times he did, but oh, the repentance afterwards, because you know what? When you're a man that lived in righteousness as much as David did, a man after God's own heart, a man that was quick to repent, when David tried these things, oh, the guilt that came upon him, the anger that came upon him toward himself, and how many times did he come and apologize and, and repent to God for it and talk about how much that his heart, one time he said, after the sins with Bathsheba, that he says, I, I feel like a pincushion. He said, the, the things of life are stabbing me. What I thought was going to be good actually ends up being weapons used against me. Romans chapter 12 and verse 19 says, beloved, don't avenge yourself. In other words, don't take revenge yourself. Rather, give it to God. Give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. What God is simply saying, go ahead and live your life out. Yeah, I don't want you to be as naive as you are. Understand there's evil in the world. Understand there's evil people in the world. But I don't want you to become like that. In fact, you're going to find out the longer you live that they come and they go, they come and they go, you'll still be here. The wealth that you're getting and the position you're getting and the things that God is blessing you with are so enduring that you can hand them on to your children and to your children's children. And so again, it simply came back to it. David found this out and, and so often had to repent for it that revenge will eat you up and create bitterness. The series that I'm offering on rest that they talked about here at halftime uh, is simply one I want you to have. And so be sure and get yourself a copy of it. When you give your problems to the Lord, you turn loose of them. And the, you know what? This is what I teach each, each day. Say, so, well, what is it that helps me give my problems to the Lord and turn loose of those things? Understanding the word of God. The more knowledge you have in the things of God, the more you grow up and the more peace you walk in, the more stability that you have, and you can begin to look at the wicked around you and say, you know what, it's all momentary, guys. It's gonna end one day. It might end before you die, but you know what? Even if you do die with all this great riches, you can't take them with you. You just can't do it. I mean, the rich man and Lazarus, we call that a parable, but Jesus didn't start out the kingdom of God is like. He just said there was a certain rich man and he had, uh, there was a certain beggar that laid at his door. This was a true story. Only Jesus was the one that got to see what was on the other side. In his deity, he watched what happened on the other side as that uh, the rich man went into hell and was in torment and Lazarus went into Abraham's bosom at great peace. And there was a chasm divided before they couldn't go back and forth. And this man suddenly realized money does you no good outside one once you die and once you leave the earth and money will do you some good while you're here, but even money itself brings problems. And so that's when he began to beg, God, just send somebody back to warn my brothers about this place. He said, no, if they won't trust Moses and the prophets, which simply comes down to it, if they won't trust the preachers and the word, I'm not going to make a personal appearance or send somebody back from the dead to go speak to them because even then they wouldn't believe it. I have sent the preachers of the word of God, that was Moses, and I've sent the word of God. And that's what we have to grow in. So you can live your life and know God and take care of your own situations and try that all your life, or else you can simply turn it over to God. You can take them and give them to him and understand he's gonna take care of you. And in the meantime, while he's taking care of you, he's gonna give you great peace in the midst of all of it. There comes a time, yes, you stand up for yourself and you have to know the difference between those, but also you never take revenge on yourself. You never say, well, God, you're taking too long. You know, I'm a, I'm a see to it that those people fall. I'm a spread rumors about them. And God's simply saying, you don't need to do that. I'll handle it in my time. When you handle it, it's going to fall apart. But when I handle it, it's all going to come out right on the other side. One of the greatest ways to place anger on the head of your enemies is to treat your problems with apathy. I mean, you really want to get back at your enemy? Act like they don't exist. Act like you don't care. Somebody told me one time, they said, well, I'm going to spread this match. I said, okay, go ahead. I can't stop you. It's a lie. It'll fall apart all by itself. You might have a momentary victory over me, but you're not going to have an eternal victory over me. I do. And I may live to be 70, 80, 90 on this earth. Who knows? I might live somewhat what we call a long time. But what is that compared to eternity? On top of that, when you spread lies, they always fall apart and you have to create more lies to cover those lies. 
Just like when Adam and Eve sinned, the first thing they did was cover themselves with fig leaves, but fig leaves are only momentary. And they have to come and put more leaves around themselves and more leaves around themselves. God gave them something that would last a long, long time when he put coats around them made out of animal skins. So it simply comes back to this. What God does is eternal. What man does is temporary. Don't try to solve your problems with temporary answers. Trust in God. If the problem is in God's hands, your enemies can't provoke you. When God's in control, you're at peace. Not thinking of your enemy is a great weapon against your enemy. They want to occupy. They want to know that what they have done is irritating you, but when it doesn't bother you, they don't know what to do. To think too much about your enemy means they're controlling you. I remember the story, and you probably heard it before. Smith Wigglesworth was upstairs in bed, and he was sleeping, and suddenly woke up to the sound of creaking noises downstairs. He thought somebody's broken into the house. He just walked down the stairs. When he got halfway down the stairs and looked down there, Satan was rocking in his own personal rocking chair back and forth. Right? And the devil looked at him and Smith just looked at him, turned around, walked off, said, oh, it's just you. Oh, don't you know that had to irritate Satan, that had to irritate demons to think they were of such little value in the eyes of Smith Wigglesworth. They didn't really care. In fact, what was more important to him was just going back to bed rather than contending with the devil. And on top of that, why contend with an, a beast? that has been defeated by Jesus Christ himself. We've been given authority over his works. We've been given authority over demonic things, but Satan himself, he'll be taken care of one day by God the Father, by Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it comes back to this, just give your worries to the Lord, then learn to rest on his promises. Psalm 55 verse 22 says this, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will not allow the righteous to be moved. I love the Hebrew word here for cast your burden. It means to slam your burdens on the Lord. It's a story. It's a picture of two wrestlers and one has been, uh, you know, uh, being defeated by the other one and suddenly he's trapped down and suddenly he flips and takes the other one and slams him down on the mat. And this is what God is saying. Quit wrestling with your problems. You wrestle with, just pick the darn things up and slam them down on the mat and cast your burden, slam your burdens on the Lord. The Lord is the mat that we slam our problems onto and he will sustain. As long as you try to fight your own battle, God stands there with his arms folded. But the moment you decide I'm gonna take you know this thing and cast off on the Lord, God said, thank you, give it to me. Now he will not allow the righteous to be moved. He's simply saying, God will take you, you'll be at rest rest and I will handle your problems for you. In other words, I created that being, I can handle him. You didn't create him, so you cannot handle him. It's up to me to handle him. I've given you authority over his works. I've given you authority over demons, but Satan himself, I will eventually take care of him. And the best thing you can do is go on as if he doesn't exist. Just quote the word at him. When Jesus was confronted by Satan three times with three temptations. They were honest temptations. Jesus didn't say, you're lying. No, they were real temptations. But in every case, Jesus responded with the word, it is written, it is written, it is written. So what God is simply telling you is, why don't you just quote the word of the devil and go on? Act like he's not important. You know why? Because he's not important. There's a word, there's a verse in Isaiah that tells us this. One day when Satan is exposed in front of the entire world and all who have been on the in the world and lived on this planet, and they suddenly see Satan, they're gonna say, This is the one? This is the guy that fought again. This is the one we were so fearful of. But this is one we thought was so big. You're gonna find out Satan is a liar, the author of lies, and he's really a defeated being. That's why Jesus told his disciples. When they cast out devils, laid hands on the sick, saw them recover, had authority over the works of Satan, Jesus said, of course, he said, I was there. I saw him be cast out of heaven as lightning. I saw him cast to the earth beneath. I saw this. In other words, I was there when it happened. I'm simply telling you, you are right now dealing with a being that has already been cast out of heaven, lost his position there. And he's simply fighting all this time to try to overthrow God and it's not going to work. I read the end of the book. God wins, Satan loses. Proverbs chapter three, verse five through seven says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. I love that word acknowledge. It simply means you don't have to go into intercessory prayer every time you face a situation. Start your day off by acknowledging him. Lord, I just acknowledge today. What, listen, there may be things I don't know about you're gonna handle. I just give it all to you. Just, just a moment. It doesn't have to be a long prayer. Just acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord 
and depart from evil. So conceitedness is what God says, I don't want, don't be wise in your own eyes. Trust the Lord, fear him, reverence him, and then depart from evil. Isaiah 28 and verse 12, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing. Trusting in God makes you enter into a rest. A rest that is more than a physical rest, it's a spiritual rest. You know, oftentimes we take vacations because we want to be at rest, but we actually take our problems with us. The point of it is you can have a vacation at home if you learn to cast your problems on the Lord, and there you can have a spiritual refreshing on the inside, and sometimes you can come back from a vacation and be just as tired as when you went because you couldn't cast your problems aside. You were mentally thinking about them all the time. Cast your burdens on the Lord. This is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29 says this. Jesus speaking to the crowd says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. He's speaking to sinners, laboring under the weight of sin, heavy laden under Satan and being under his domination, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am gentle in heart, you will find rest for your souls. What does he say is the key for a Christian to enter into rest? After you have received Jesus as Savior, now take his yoke on you and learn of him. Learning is the key to walking in rest for your soul. So the moment you're born again, what's the first command? Start learning the word. For I am gentle of heart and you'll find rest for your soul. The great thing we rest on is the promises of God. When Jesus was in a ship, and, and told his disciples, let us pass over to the other side. Notice he didn't say, let's try to pass over to the other side. He said, let us go. He didn't say, let some of us go. He said, let all of us go to the other side. He didn't say, let's go halfway and sink. No, he said, let's go all the way to the other side. Here's the simple promise. Let all of us go over to the other side. And when he got in the ship, Jesus grabbed a pillow, fluffed it up and went to sleep. The disciples saw a storm coming. The storm was so bad, the boat was being tossed everywhere, everywhere. And they shook Jesus and they woke him up and said, don't you care that we perish? What a contradiction. Jesus said, we're going to the other side. They said, we're perishing. Jesus didn't say, let's perish before we get to the other side. He just said, let us go to the other side. And Jesus went to sleep on a pillow. Jesus was so angry with them. He woke up, stilled the storm, and then looked at them and said, oh, you of little faith. And so again, he chewed them out. He upbraided them, the King James says. I want you to understand something. The greatest display he was showing them of faith is not to still the storm. The greatest display of faith is to sleep through the storm, resting through the storms of life. And this is what God wants us to do. This is all I'm telling you. You want to not be taken in by the pressures of the world, learn to rest in God, Next of all, learn to walk in patience toward the things of this world, and God will bring you through successfully every single time. You'll come out on the other side and look back, and guess what? Your enemies were drowned, not you. You made it to the other side. Well, have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow. I might, I might continue on with the subject. I don't know, but we'll go on talking about the faith and rest of God. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.